Hey there. If you want to open up your Bibles to Joshua 2, I've got a couple different things for you here uh, tonight. If I, I expect probably most of our Bibles only have one page marker. I couldn't think of the word to, to refer to that. One of these strings that's a page marker uh, in that. Uh, and so even though I don't think that I'm going to be that this is not going to work on the first one that we do tonight. Um, go ahead and mark your page. Stick your page marker at Joshua 2. That's the story of Rahab and her delivering the spies uh, whenever they were spying out the city of Jericho. And we did that last Sunday morning. We talked about Rahab and salvation. And in Joshua chapter 2, our main text last Sunday morning was verses 8 through 14. And there were four things that we did in that lesson to say, here are the four things that are really the, the, the foundation. These are the basis of all salvation. Number one, in verse 9, Rahab says, I know. Um, and she is explaining uh, that she is interpreting the signs of the times in uh, an accurate way. She sees the Jewish people just across the other side of the Jordan River. I don't think that she could actually see them, but she knew that they were there. And she says, I know what this is. I, I know that this is the Lord's doing, and I know what, uh, why it's happening, and I know that it is happening, and all of this. Number two in verse 10 is that she said, we have heard. And she s refers back to how God saved the children of Israel in crossing the Red Sea and how they fought against the kings of Sihon and Og and, and defeated them in, in that way. And so uh, we have heard the basis of her salvation was, I know what God has accomplished. Um, the third thing at the very end of verse 11 is she makes her great confession. The Lord your God, he is God. The uh, the reality of the circumstances based upon what God had done and her interpreting all of these things in a way so as to say, this is God's work, this is what's happening, this is what it means for me, led her to the conclusion that Yahweh in heaven is in fact the one true creator God of heaven and earth. And the only thing that's different about her confession, which led to salvation in our confession, which leads to salvation, is not... The God of the Bible is the one true creator, God of heaven and earth, but also that Jesus is his son and that Jesus is king. That's our, our, um, our confession, our proclamation. And then at the, verse, uh, the end of verse 13, you have her ask. And, and she asks this more, but it's very plain at the end of verse 13, save our lives from death. Save me and save my family. Um, and there was that quote. I just love that quote. I can't stop thinking about it that we read last time. Um, a knowledge of God doesn't stop to think about and ponder who God is and what God has done. Uh, a knowledge of God goes and bows at his feet and begs for mercy and salvation. Uh, and so that's what she did. She said, save us from death. That was last Sunday morning. So I would suggest, if you would, stick your Bible marker right there in Joshua chapter 2, and then turn over to Joshua chapter 9, which is the story of the Gibeonite deception. And this is the way that I'll be doing this tonight. You know, I'll stick my finger in Joshua 9, and I'll probably try and leave it there. And I'll just go back and forth this way, because I only have one string in this Bible. Um, but what we're going to be doing tonight is something that came up in Bible class a couple of times. When Ed was teaching this two Wednesdays ago, Dave was the one who made the comment. And Dave's comment was, um, there are a lot of parallels between the Rahab salvation story and the Gibeonite salvation story. And I think that we read it and we, we say, wait a second, it kind of feels like this is the same thing twice. I think that's exactly what Sarah said last Wednesday night. When, and I love, even the, I, love, I love the thought process because Sarah's comment last Wednesday night was, 
uh, I don't know, Sarah, I'm going to misquote you here, but it was something like, it was something like, I'm not sure about this, but it seems like, like, you know, it's there. You, you read the text, you, you feel it, you know that it's there, but uh, until you just go verse by verse, word by word, and start putting out the parallels, uh, you know it's there, but you don't know what it is. Well, what tonight, uh, tonight what we're going to do is we're going to spend some time just looking back and forth at these parallels. Um, what is similar between the Rahab and the spy, uh, the Rahab salvation situation in Joshua two, and the salvation of the Gibeonites in Joshua chapter nine, and I don't do this just because it's a fun little thing. Like, ooh, look at all of these parallels. This is fun. These parallels are our parallels. This is the foundation and the basis of our salvation. And so, these principles that we're learning about are principles that are going to be true for us. Uh, and for salvation in our world today. And so let's start uh, looking at, at some of these uh, parallels. I said it's not going to work for the first one because for Rahab, for the first one, we're going to actually start in chapter 6. Still leave your marker in chapter 2, but go to chapter 6 and verse 17 because this is where you see the actual condemnation. We knew what God said to the Israelites. Whenever they crossed over the Jordan River, they were going to go to the city of Jericho and they were going to destroy it entirely. It's called in the book of Joshua and the book of Deuteronomy, the city is under the ban. It's all devoted to destruction uh, for the purpose of offering it up to God. Uh, chapter 6 and verse 17 says this very clearly. Because this is where Joshua is saying, hey, let's go in and do this thing. Ready, set, go. Here's your instructions. Verse 17. The city and all that is within it shall be devoted to the Lord for destruction. Um, and then you see Rahab's salvation there. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her and in her house shall live. Um, she was condemned to death. That was her fate. It's the same fate as every single person within the walls of the city of Jericho. Death. There's no hope. Uh, it's going to end badly. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, we looked at this last Wednesday night. There were a couple of different passages that, um, that point us specifically to God saying to the Jewish people, when you go into the land, do not make a covenant with them. Here's one of those. Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 and 2. When the Lord your God brings you into the land, that you are entering to take possession of it and clears away many nations before you. This is why I came to Deuteronomy 7. He specifically lists the people. Hittites, Girgashites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites. Listen to this one. The Hivites... The Jebusites, seven nations more numerous and mighty than you. When the Lord your God gives them over to you and you defeat them, then you must devote them to complete destruction. You shall make no covenant with them and show no mercy to them. In Joshua chapter 9 and verse 7, in the story of the Gibeonites, in verse 7 we learn that Gibeon is the name of the city and the people who lived in the city of Gibeon are Hivites some of the inhabitants of the land. And so verse 7 says, The men of Israel said to the Hivites, they didn't know that they were the Hivites yet, but they said, Perhaps you live among us. How can we make a covenant with you? Um, their fate was destruction. There was, there was nothing for them but death and condemnation. That's number one. And so maybe you can think of a better way to, to do this. Incidentally, since I'm saying maybe you can think of a better way to do this, there's going to be more parallels. You're going to find more parallels than just the ones that I list. And so I would, I would love it if you would tell me what those are, and I'll just continue adding to my notes. But maybe you will think of something better to say than this, that they're all condemned um, to death. They're both utterly hopeless. There is nothing for them. They, they, they see the city of Jericho. There are the Jewish people. 
In a matter of days, they're coming across the river and we're dead. It's just hopeless. There's no hope in that. Um, it's, it's the meaning of the word despair. There's no way out. And the same thing is true with the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites were facing the situation with, with uh, knowing not only what had happened uh, with I uh, and Jericho and Sihon and Og, like Rahab knew, uh, they were hopeless. There was nothing for them. And this is the thing that I want to do with each one of these points is to bring it back home to us and to ourselves before Jesus. This is who we are. Condemned to death, spiritual death, physical death, condemned to death and hopeless. And without Jesus, there's nothing but despair. I have nothing. There's no way, there's no way out of this mess that I'm in right now with death on my doorstep. There are several passages in the Bible that you could look at. I always think of Romans chapter 3 and Romans chapter 6 because they go... Uh, together, um, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then in Romans chapter 6, the wages of that sin is death. That's, that's, our, that's our end. Death. Um, ultimately physical death, but beyond that, spiritual death and separation from God. Number two. Both people act based upon what they had heard about God. We spent a good deal of time talking about this in chapter 2 and verse 10. This was one of our points last Sunday morning. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. Look over at Joshua chapter 9 and verses 9 and 10. In Joshua chapter 9 and verses 9 and 10, the, the Hivites, the people of the city of Gibeon, they said almost exactly the same thing. They said, from a very, we, we came from a very distant um, country, we're servants, uh, and we've come because of the name of the Lord your God. For we have heard a report of him. And all that he did in Egypt, and all that he did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon, uh, to the king of Heshbon, and to Og, the king of Baashan, who lived in Ashtaroth. Um, so their action was motivated from hearing about what God had done. And, and, and I made this point last Sunday morning, and I'll make this point again. The Bible ultimately points us to who God is. But so much of the Bible is narrative. That is, it's just a story. And so we read about the story of Adam and Eve in the garden. And we read about the story of Noah and the ark. And we read about the story of God and his relationship with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And how the children of Israel went to Egypt and how God saved them. And we read about the story of the kings. And in all of these stories, in all of this narrative, what we're doing in learning about what God has done is we're learning about who God is and what he's like. Whenever I met Becky, and she immediately fell in love with me. Um, no, that's probably not the truth about how that happened. But, um, you know, I've told you before that um, she tried to get rid of me several times, and I wouldn't go away. And I just thought she was so cool. And that's really what it was. I just thought she was cool, and I wanted to be around her all the time. And... Uh, it's, it's what happens with us. I want, I want to get to know you. I like you. I'm interested. I want to know more about you. And so I don't sit down. You don't sit down with somebody and say, tell me about yourself. <laughs> and so, well, you know, I'm this tall and this is what I like to eat for breakfast. And those are interesting facts. But I learn about you by knowing about your life and seeing how you live and what you do and what you like and what you don't like and how you respond to other people and, and all of these different things. One of the things that, that drew me to Becky so much, maybe more than anything else, was her interaction with her family. I loved her family. 
And I loved her parents and the way that her parents interacted with their kids and how she and her brothers and sisters interacted with her, her family. And I watched that. And by watching how they behaved, I came to know her. It's the same thing that's true with God. We know about God because we hear about what God has done. It doesn't mean that you have to be some sort of high-level PhD level theologian. You know, Rahab probably didn't know the story of Noah and the ark. She probably didn't know Genesis 1 and how God created the world and everything in it. She knew what God had done with the Israelites and Egypt. And Based upon that knowledge, she said, that's somebody I need to tie myself up to. The same thing was true with the Gibeonites. They had heard all of these things and they said, that's somebody who I need to tie myself to. Uh, otherwise, I'm afraid because I'm hopeless. And so the question that would make this one personal and bring it to real life, I think, for each one of us is, have you heard? Have you heard? This is a gossipy sort of thing. Get ready to listen. Have you heard about what God did through Jesus? Yes, I have heard that. Cool. <laughs> I've heard about it too. And it's not just a good story. It's a story about who God is and what God has done. Number three, both Rahab and the Gibeonites, the way that I put this one on the board is to say they deserted their own people, which they did. Um, they threw their own people under the bus, both of them in these situations, and we'll read about it. But even more than this, deserting their own people, Rahab and the Gibeonites, they laid their lives on the line for this God and for the salvation that they were asking for from this God. Consider in Joshua chapter 2 and verses 3 through 6, this is the story of the spies who come into the city and they're hiding at this point in verse 3. The king of Jericho sent to Rahab saying, Bring out the men who have come to you who entered your house, for they have come to search out all the land. But the woman had taken the two men and hidden them. And she said, True, the men came to me, but I did not know where they were from. And... Uh, when the gate was about to be closed at dark, the men went out. I don't know where they went. Pursue them quickly, for you will overtake them. Let me ask you a question. What do you think would have happened to Rahab if she would have been caught in that lie? What's your guess? If the people, the king, the authorities within the city of Jericho had found out that she did know that they were spies and that she harbored them and hid them and helped them escape from her house. If she were caught in that lie, what do you think would have happened to her? There's no question. There's really no question. Uh, even within modern times today, uh, treason still in all countries is punishable by death. Um, and so Rahab, for the sake of associating herself with God, laid it on the line. She, she put herself out there and she said, um, it's either the hopelessness and despair of death at the hand of the Israelites um, or risking uh, death and, and the possible punishment consequences that come uh, with trying to associate myself with these people. Look at the same situation in chapter 9 and verses 1 through 3. This is exactly what happened with the Gibeonites. Starting in verse 1, as soon as all the kings who were beyond the Jordan in the hill country and the lowlands and all along the great sea toward Lebanon, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Havites, Jebusites, heard of this, they gathered together as one to fight against Joshua and Israel. Everybody says the Israelites are coming. We got to band together and fight against them. But, in verse 3, but when the inhabitants of Gibeon heard what Joshua had done to Jericho and to Ai, they on their part acted with cunning, and they did the rest of the story that we've been talking about recently. And sure enough, in chapter 10 in verses 1 through 4, Adonai Zedek is the king of Jerusalem at this time. Jerusalem is not a friendly place at this time. He's a pagan king. The Jewish people have not taken Jerusalem yet. He 
goes around to all of these other kings and he says, okay, the Israelites are coming, but the Gibeonites turned on us. They're our priority number one. We need to, we need to shut them down. We need to stop them. I want you to think about this for a second. Seriously, I want you to put yourself in the place of both Rahab and the Gibeonites and see what your options are. Without God, without Jesus, my option is certain hopeless despair and death. Without God and Jesus. I am, I'm looking around here to everybody who's, who's here tonight, and I would assume that we're all on the same page. We believe this. We we know this to be true. Here's my option. Or I can associate myself with God and with God's people. But when I associate with God and God's people, it's not a free ride. Um, I got to stick myself out there. And, and the same thing is true for us in the world that we live in. When Jesus describes salvation, he describes it happening at the point of baptism which is a burial. We bury things that are dead. Salvation is to say, all right, this is, this is what needs to happen. It's either uh, death by God or death for God. Um, and so I die to myself, and I'm buried in the waters of baptism. Um, there's a lot at stake. It's not just a free ride. I think that's a, a pretty good lesson that comes from this story. Number four, both of them operated through deception. In chapter two and verse four, Rahab deceived the Jericho police when they came and said, do you know about the spies? She said, I, uh, they came and I, I told them to leave and they went that way. It's a story of deception. The story of the Gibbon, Gibeonites is a story of, of deception. They knew that God's people were not allowed to make a covenant uh, with the people of the land. And so they went to extreme limits. They put on their old clothes and their old shoes and, and they took their food and they, they made it crusty and they made it look old. And when they came to uh, the Israelites, they said, we are from a distant country. Look at us. Our clothes are worn out from traveling so far. Our food is rotten because we've had it in our bags for so long. It's a story of deception. And while the message of our class last Wednesday was a message of integrity and to talk about Joshua and the leaders of the Israelites who gave their word and who were supposed to be people who did what they said. That's what we talked about this morning in our Bible class. God's people are people who do what they say. You might think to yourself, well, this deception, that's the exact opposite of the last two lessons that I've taught. But what you see here is, yes, deception, which, which is wrong. And I don't, I don't, justify deception as being right in this case. But what we see here is two people, Rahab or two groups of people, the Gibeonites, who are desperate. They don't know what to do. And there's no way out of this situation for them. And so when we find ourselves in desperation, this is the thing that we talk about in our world today. We call it fight or flight, you know, and there are some people in, in difficult circumstances and desperate circumstances who will just freeze up and do nothing at all. And then there's other people who will say, I got to do something. It might be wrong, but I got to do something because I can't just sit here and die. That's what Rahab and the Gibeonites did. They found themselves in a desperate situation where they knew that God was the only hope of survival and life for them. And so they did what they thought they needed to do in order to get that life. And we said this a couple of times. For both of them, all they wanted was to live. At the end of Joshua chapter 2 and verse 13, I guess let's read all of verse 13 because this is where... Rahab just enumerates the situation. She says, I, this is what I want. I want a sign that you will save alive my father's house and give me a sure sign. Uh, I'm sorry, that you will save alive my father, my mother, my brothers and sisters and all who belong to them. Here's the big ask. Deliver our lives from death. That's what they wanted. In chapter 9, 
and verse 22, Joshua comes to the Gibeonites and he says, Why have you done this thing? Why did you deceive us? Which is really a silly question. Any of us would have done the same uh, under these circumstances. Uh, why did you say that you're from very far off when you really, in fact, dwell among us? In verses 24 and 25, they answered Joshua, because it was told to your servants for a certainty that the Lord your God had commanded his servant Moses to give you all the land and to destroy all the inhabitants of the land before you. So we feared greatly for our lives because of you. Uh, uh, because of you, and, and we did this thing. And now, behold, we are in your hand. Whatever seems good and right in your sight, to do, do it to us. These are the words of desperate people. These are the words of somebody who knows that this is their only hope, and they throw themselves at the feet of Joshua, and they said, we were scared for our lives if you think it's best to kill us, then kill us, but please don't. We'll do whatever we need to do. That's, that's my plea for salvation. That's the thing that brought me to the Lord from the very start. Uh, I would like to think that my relationship with God has moved beyond where it started, but I became a Christian at the very start because I processed the reality of eternal hell, and I didn't want to burn there forever. And out of fear, I threw myself at the Lord and said, please, I don't want to die. I don't want this end. They just wanted to live. They both asked for covenants, for promises. In chapter 2 and verse 12, Rahab wasn't okay to just get an okay from these guys she said please swear to me by the lord in verse 12 and she asked him please give me a sure sign i need you to show me that this thing that you're saying that you're going to do that it's real that it's true give me a sign that this is real. In chapter 9 and verse 6, this was the, the ask for the Gibeonites. They said, make a covenant with us at the very end of verse 6. We don't want you to say, okay, this is fine. You're from a distant land. We want you to bind yourself to us and to say that you're going to do this thing that you did. And, and there's a couple things that I think of with this one in terms of Christianity. Number one, this is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of Jesus is God saying, here is a person who died, and here's what I do for my people. I bring them back from death. It is a sure sign and the promise of God to say, this is what I'm offering to you. Life in the face of death. There's another thing that screams out from the New Testament that I, I, I know that this is not really what this lesson is about, but it seems like since we're reading this language about give me a sure sign, make a covenant with me. Look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14. There are a couple of places in the New Testament where you see this language that God has given to us Christians the Holy Spirit, and the word that's used in my ESV is, as he gave us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee. Um, the word guarantee, some of your versions will say as a pledge. It's, it's the idea of a down payment. He said, here's what I'm going to give to you so that you can know that this salvation that I'm giving to you is real and that you're one of my people and that it's going to last. Read it with me. Ephesians 1 and verses 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard of the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Do you remember? Rahab said, please give me a sure sign. Paul says, this is what happens when you're a Christian. You are sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, 
who is the guarantee or the pledge or the down payment of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. You can read the same sort of thing in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. Um, this is in Romans chapter 8. This is the way that I think that, that, that I understand this the, the most. Um, when you become a Christian, you are adopted into the family of God. Romans chapter 8 tells us that, that we've been adopted into family, uh, into God's family. But in the same chapter, in the same context, what Paul says is that what we are ultimately all of us waiting for is adoption until we can become sons of God. So what is it? Are we adopted into the family of God or are we waiting to be adopted um, as, as children of God? And the answer is yes, both. God has said this life is not heaven uh, and there is still physical death that happens here and now in this life, in this world. But my seal, my promise, my down payment to you is the Holy Spirit, life. You have life in yourselves if you're a Christian. And that's the reason why Christians face death without fear and say, ain't no thing, because this is not the end of the road for me. I've got the promised Holy Spirit of life, and I know that death is not the end of the road for God's people. Okay. Both ask for covenants, for a seal, for a sign. And God has given us a covenant and a seal and a sign. Both of these stories involve God's people um, keeping their promise. In chapter 4 and verse 14. Let's see, let me get over here. Joshua. I'm sorry, I think that should be chapter 2. Joshua chapter 2 and verse 14. The men... Uh, the Israelites, the two spies, said to Rahab, Our life for yours, even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. The end of this story is God, through his representative people, saying to this hopeless woman, I'm going to do what I told you I'm going to do. I'm going to do my promise. I'm going to uphold my end of the deal. In chapter 6, in verses 19 through 21. Um, boy, I think I messed that one up all to pieces. Is that Should that be chapter 9? Let's just skip that one because that's what we did last Wednesday was to make an entire lesson out of the fact that, that Joshua and the leaders of God's people said, yes, we're going to do this we're going to do this thing uh, because we gave you our word. We're going to stick to our word uh, for God's people. The message for us is that God says, I told you, you can have life. Um, I see this sort of thing throughout the Bible. I see this, this, this lack of presumptuousness. So when Jonah went to the city of Nineveh and he said, 40 days, the city's going to be destroyed. The response of the people of the land was not some sort of a demand for God or for Jonah to change his mind. They said, let's repent. Let's do sackcloth and ashes. Let's pray. Let's do a fast. And, and the word that they used in their attitude was perhaps. Perhaps God will change his mind. And you see this lack of presumptuousness all throughout the scripture. When people come to God, they, they say, perhaps he will save me. But one thing that I see a lot is I see Christians who know this story and who know the character of God, who still are afraid of death. And the mindset is, uh, I have done what I'm supposed to do and handed my life over to Jesus. I sure hope that he does what he says he's going to do. <laughs> I hope that I will be saved. And the lack of presumptuousness, I think, is biblical and to be commended. But the story that we walk away with from 
from Rahab and from Joshua and the leaders of Israel and all throughout the story of God where God describes himself as a righteous and faithful God is that God will do what he said he's going to do. And if God has said to us, I will save you from eternal spiritual death, then our response is to be like Rahab and the Gibeonites and to say, thank you, God, for saving me from death. To trust him. When we talk about salvation, we say, here's what you need to do in order to be saved. Believe, repent, confess, be baptized, and all this stuff. Part of what we're talking about now is faith and belief that God is the place where we find salvation. These are stories about how God and God's people keep their words. Finally, they were incorporated into God's people. Look at chapter uh, 6 and verse 25. This is actually supposed to be 625. Uh, we read this just a little bit ago. Rahab the prostitute and her father's household and all who belonged to her, Joshua saved alive. And listen to this. She has lived in Israel to this day because she hid the messengers from Joshua I'm sorry, whom Joshua sent to spy out the land of Jericho. And uh, not only did, did God incorporate her and her family into his family, uh, you find out later on in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 5 that Rahab is one of the descendants of Jesus. She is actually literally incorporated into God's family in that she's one of the descendants of the Lord himself. And the same thing is true for the Gibeonites. You see the Gibeonites 500 years down the road in the story of David and Saul because Saul didn't keep the promise that Joshua made. The Gibeonites are still there and the promise is still true. And a thousand, I think it's 960 years down the road when the, the, the Jewish exiles come back from Babylonian captivity in the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah 3 and I think it's Nehemiah 7. There are the Gibeonites on the wall building alongside the people of God. Would you turn over to 1 Kings chapter 8 with me? There's one passage that I want to read and I'm not going to I'm not just going to keep on and on. There's several points that I'd like to make from this. I think I'm just going to go ahead and stop because I think you get it. But but this is one that I really do want us to read. And maybe I'll just refer to the others. Number one is that God has always wanted and been interested in outsiders. Um, I, I would guess that this is the thing that made Sarah squirm that brought her comment the other day. Because I, I said, I made this big point. God said, make no covenant with the people of the land. But Joshua and the leaders made a covenant with the people of the land. It was wrong. They should not have done it, but they did it anyway. And, and these are the consequences. And what are we going to do? And we know the story of God and we know the character of God. And we're like, yeah, but even though the people of the land were condemned, God is always taking outsiders and making them a part of his family. Always. From the very start of the scripture. And I think there's no place you see this more clear than 1 Kings chapter 8, starting in verse 41. Uh, after Solomon built the temple, he says this great prayer, starting in verse 22. And this is called the prayer of dedication. This is when the temple becomes the temple. Look at verse 41. This is part of Solomon's prayer about the temple. Likewise, God, when a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm. That should sound familiar. When he comes and prays towards this house, here in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. The temple and the city of Jerusalem was ultimately designed and built to be a place where people from all nations would come 
to the place where God is. And so God takes those who are outside of his family and he brings them in and makes them people who are in his family. Number two, I won't read all the passages that go with this, but I will say it quickly and make a reference. Nobody, nobody is absolutely lost beyond all hope until death. Until your chance for repentance is over. There's one example that I have in my notes that I won't read right now uh, that I think is maybe the biggest example in all the scriptures of this point, and that's Manasseh. Manasseh was the king of God's people in Jerusalem who caused God to come to the end of his rope and to say, I'm not doing this anymore. I'm sending you away. You're, you're done. He, and he, he sacrificed his own children. He took pagan gods and pagan idols and put them up in the temple of God, the most offensive thing he could possibly do. And he paid the price for it. But at the end of his life, if you want to turn and read there a little bit later on in 2 Chronicles 33 and verse 12, Manasseh repented and turned to God and God forgave him. It didn't undo all the consequences of his bad decisions up to this point, but even Manasseh could repent and come back to the Lord. There is nothing that you have done that has separated you so far away from God that you can't come back to him. Number three, God doesn't save those who are righteous. Rahab wasn't righteous. She was a lying prostitute. That's not offensive language. She literally was a lying prostitute in this story. And the Gibeonites were not righteous. They were some of the pagans who were condemned to death because of their sin that they had committed in the land. We don't read this story and say, wow, God, God is sure good to those who are good to themselves, who are living an upright and moral life, who come to him. God saves righteous people. That's not what this story is about. This story is about how God saves those who come to him in faith for mercy. And we ask for mercy because we're not righteous. And I would finish with this. Every single one of us will have two reactions to the stories that we hear about God. We're either going to be like the people uh, that the Gibeonites rebelled against in Joshua chapter 10, who heard about God and armed themselves and knew good and well that what they were doing was hopeless, but that they were going to go down fighting. Or we can hear and fear and bow ourselves to the Lord and say, please save me. Those are your two choices. Fight to the death. And sure enough, the end is going to be death or bow before God and ask for mercy. Rahab, the Gibeonites, Manasseh, all the stories in the Bible are the same. The Jews in Acts chapter 2 who were saved from their sin. If you know who Jesus is, you've heard the story and you know what it means for the world and for your life, that there's no hope for anything but spiritual eternal death without him. Why wouldn't you come and bow before his feet and say, please save me from death? That's what Christianity is. That's what it's all about, what we're doing here. If we can help you with that today, come forward, make your needs known as we stand and sing the invitation song. Ring, Roy.